Months have passed since Obia Nuju and her friends put their little stunt in the famous salon in the village. No one knew they were the ones, and the three have kept it so. They were certain that whatever they had uncovered was supposed to stay hidden, and they were unsure what may become of them if words got out. The village of Umadi has settled back into her familiar reading, and they were also moving on with their life. If we each keep this to ourselves, everything will be all right, Ibube had insisted. Abiyanuju and Ngazi agreed with her. They were too afraid to even go to the sea as they had planned, and Akuna was still missing. They went on living their lives, and the fear of the unknown had its claw buried deep in their clavicles. Everything was fine except that they saw extra hands in every shadow, and were particularly jumpy whenever someone whispered in their ears. There were even days they forgot Akuna and her mysteries. Their friends were gradually approaching marriageable age, and their parents had begun mentoring them and seeking traits and skills they would learn before moving to their husband's houses. It would be hard her mother had on her tail. You must learn to print the Ube designs, her mother insisted. It would be had no problem with learning the local tattoo process. Her main concern was that she would have to travel to the village of Opangwa to learn it. This meant she would cross two rivers from Umuadi before reaching there. How would she see her friends? Everyone she knew would be so far away. As if her mother had read her mind, she added, and you would not have your gossip partners there to distract you. During their evening rendezvous under the Roma tree, she shared her dilemma with her friends and found out that she was not the only one in the bind. Ngasi's parents have already paid the required price of 10 large tubas of yam and a he goat, Umazi Odun, so she can live with the Odun family and learn clothing, weaving, and dyeing. And Obianuju will be going to Apama, three villages away on the west side of Umuadi, to learn herbal healing. My parents have prepared for us to live in three days, Obianuju told her friends. If we do not reach there on or before the next Mpo Market Day, I will not be allowed to join the healing class until this time next year. Mpo Market Day? That is four days from today, Gazi pointed out. Yes, my friend. That is why we live in three days. At least, I can arrive a day before, Obianuju explained. But why the street road? Ebube asked. I live in one week. Can't you make some excuse for us to spend this week together? The healers say the gods had appointed the day. The preparatory rituals are already running. I must be in the land on Mpo Market Day to be marked by the gods. I will miss you, my friend, Ebube said. Good luck, and learn well because when you return, you will not only be the healer I consult, you will also become the seer, Ngozi stated, serious but with fondness in her voice. The three friends hugged each other. Then they sat there and discussed no important thing, just joked around and joined each other's company until the moon came up and they went to their respective homes. Three months after the girls had moved on to learn their trades, there came a stranger into Omari. The young man was sturdy built and tall with a face that people can hardly resist. He was a small talker and soon won over the hearts of many with his charm. He was a hunter and he had come to Umadi with his wife. As a new couple, he wished to settle in the land and raise his children there. His name is Okunta. The elders welcomed him and praised his respectful attitude. During the New Year festival, Okunta took a very large bushmeat he had killed during hunting to the village head as a gift. He brought his wife with him to thank the village head for accepting him into the community. The village head accepted his gift, calling out to his wife to prepare hot pepper soup with the meat. Okunta bowed in respect and urged his wife to greet the elders. As she raised her bowed head, the elders' eyes opened wide in recognition. Okunta's wife is none other than Hakuna, the famous hairdresser who had gone missing over a year ago. The village of Elema buzzed with the news of the new hairstylist in town, who braided her with astonishing speed. She was friendly and ladies loved to gather in her salon even when they did not need her services. 
The hairstylist had two other ladies who worked with her in her salon, but none of the two matched her skill and speed. The salon had only one rule that cannot be broken, and if you insisted, you would have to leave without making your hair. The rule is no mirrors. You cannot use a mirror in this salon. A small group of villagers started talking about the old rule around the village. Soon, words reached the village head of this astonishing woman who braced her with astonishing speed and skill. The stylist was invited to the palace, and when asked why the rule of no mirrors in her salon, she said, It distracts me from my work. When she was dismissed from the presence of the village head, on her way out, the wife asked, Can I invite you to the palace to braid my hair? She stopped in her path, swallowed hard, squared her shoulder and responded, No. Anyone that wishes to have me braid your hair must come to my salon or let me decide where. And what is your name? The queen asked gently. Olama, she answered and left the palace. Olama's response to the queen angered the head. Who is she to refuse my wife? He fumed. In this village, refusing the king or queen's demand is made by severe punishment. To appease him, the elders decided that it was best if Olama left their village. They had gathered from their discussion with her that she hails from Omoadi. The two villages have their differences, and currently they were at a point where there were neither enemies nor friends. Imposing a harsher penalty for Olama's impudence may instigate war. As Olama packed her things with the ladies who worked with her, a man walked into the salon. Pretty lady, can I braid my hair? He asked. The ladies looked up from what they were doing and saw a bold, handsome young man standing in the shop. The irony was not lost on them and they could not help but smile. The one on your head or your face? Olama asked. Does it matter? This time, Olama laughed. That's more like it, the young man said. What do you want? Olama asked. To come with you. I like you and I want you to be my wife. I know you are leaving town and I do not mind. You know me as the hunter. He paused. Olama exchanged looks with the ladies with her. You what? Was all she could say. Go with you, the young man answered. You heard me right the first time. You have to agree. Why is that? Because I will still follow you even if you say no. You are crazy. Thank you. My name is Okunta. Early the next morning, Olama, the two ladies who worked with her, and Okunta set out on their journey to Umwadi to cover the story of how they came. They had agreed to tell everyone that they came from Uboko, five villages away from Omwadi. That way, it would be more difficult to investigate them. A hush fell over the room as the elders recognized Akuna. Welcome to Mwadi, Okunta. But who is this beautiful woman with you? Mazoka asked. She is my wife. Oh, welcome, Unni. What is your name? Mazoka continued. Olamma, she responded. Thank you for the game, the head greeted, and with that, Okunta and his wife Olama left the room. The elders exchanged glasses with each other. The head requested that the seer be summoned to the palace the next Ekemake day. Abenja and her master were gathering help when she saw flashes of bright light and her eyes went white. She could not tell what was around her any longer, but began to speak in a deep voice. Her mentor took her back to the healing house and had a scribe record the things she said. The high priestess was invited to examine her, but as soon as she walked into the room where Obianju was, she bowed to her, greeting her as the priestess healer. When her side returned the next day, Obianju was shaken by her vision. Amongst other visions, she had seen the seer of Umwadi pointing her out to the village head and the elders, as the one who unleashed the powers of the dark world on the village of Umwadi by using a mirror in a corner salon two years ago. The high priestess was the only one allowed to read the visions. It is her duty to train Obianujun in her priestess duties going forward. She assured her that the visions were more of a guide 
to her calling as a priestess. Fear up and do not fear, the priestess said. As you learn your duties, you will know what to do to right the wrong. With that, the Herbal Healing School in Apama prepared to send Obianuju to her parents with a high priestess to complete the rites needed for her to resume training as a priestess healer. Early in the morning on Ikemaket Day, Obianuju set out to Muadi with a high priestess. They arrived in the evening and as custom demands, the high priestess must pay homage to the leader of every land she enters before going on her mission. It is also very important that she visits the leader of Umwadi as his own has been chosen by the gods as a healer priestess. Abiyanuju led the way to the palace and as soon as he set foot in the courtyard, the seer pointed at her. There she is, she said. This is the one who used a mirror in Akona's salon two years ago. The spirit weaver has returned with vengeance. The head stood and pointed his staff of office at Obianuju. But before he could speak a word, the staff caught fire. In the chaos that followed, the high priestess walked in. She raised her staff of office and the fire quenched. Everyone bowed to the high priestess, including the seer. Thank you, priestess, the head said and took his seat. What brings the great one our way today? I have business in Omari and I have come to pay homage to the head as his customary, she responded. You are welcome to our land. The gods bless us with your presence, the head said. Forgive me if I offended you on arrival, that you set my staff on fire. We will set a place befitting of a priestess for you to stay while you are with us. The priestess looked around the room and said, There is no need for you to set a place for me to stay. While I am here, I will stay wherever the person who brought me here stays. I am with her now, though she still has a lot to learn. And I am not the one you should apologize to. You should apologize to her. You offended her, not me, she said, pointing to Obianuju. Everyone in the room turned to look at her. The princess nodded at her and she bowed to the head and the elders. I am Obianuju, daughter of Obioma and Ezinli. Everyone remained silent until the head spoke. What do you mean I offended her? Is it for her sake that you set my ancestor's staff on fire? He fumed. The priestess smiled. Careful, my king. I am only but a servant. Yes, you offended my master. She was the one who set your ancestral staff on fire. Who are you to point your staff at the spirit healer? I merely point the fire as she is still under my tutelage and taking some time to balance. At this, everyone in the room watched with their mouth open. Be thankful she had bestowed the power to make such decisions on me at a time like this. Or I would have just stood by and watched you burn, the priestess added. By the way, we have stopped by the palace to inform you that the gods have chosen the spirit healer at last. Obianuju, henceforth, shall be called the priestess healer in Umwadi and the seven bound kingdoms. I will stay with her at her father's house until our time in Umwadi is up this season.